Happy Sabbath, church. Good morning. Autumn is here, but it feels like winter has arrived. Yeah? Forgive us. We still have to abide by COVID uh, safety standards. That's why we've got our windows open. So it is fresh. We've got some lovely air. I'd um, love to you to turn to somebody nearby and just welcome them to church. with some a happy Sabbath, all of that beautiful stuff. Um, let's warm this place up a little bit. Thank you for showing up, everybody, this morning. It's good to be here. It's good to be uh, in God's house with his family. And uh, young people, thank you for your music. Uh, it's been beautiful. Faith, thank you for that story. I, I drive through Stratford all the time and cross the Avon River and just had beautiful, just sort of imagination running wild. And I'm going to actually invite you now to uh, use your imagination again. Um, Darren last week did a beautiful introduction to who the Thessalonians were, uh, these people of this little port city in uh, Thessalonica, Thessalonica, Thessaloniki, if you're Greek. Um, one thing, I, I sort of hopped on YouTube this week, and I'm like, you know what, I, I don't know a whole lot about this place other than what Darren shared. Um, I did meet a girl one time when I was in Greece, and I was on a ferry, and I was on a Bible lands tour, and we were heading to Patmos, and she was heading to, to Thessalonica, um, but that was all I knew. I'm like, oh, that's a biblical place. And she didn't speak English, but we were, we were using my ancient Greek textbook to communicate. And, and just mind you, just imagine, we're on a boat, and this old lady, she's like trying to... Everybody was just entertained by our conversation. And this lady, old lady just stands up, she picks up my book, and she's like... And I'm like, what? And some young guy's like, oh, she says... This is from 2,000 years ago. I'm like, yeah. She, and he's like, it will not work. <laughs> I was like, I'm trying. Anyway, but yeah, that, that's about as far as my experience with Thessalonica goes. But as I did a little bit of research on man, what I discovered is Thessalonica, it's a very beautiful place. But one of the things that are very interesting and striking about it, it's like, it, it's a bay city. It's a port city. And... Um, if you can bear, if you take out a map, you'll sort of see that the city sort of looks across a body of water. And on the other side of the body of water is the Mount Olympus Ranges. Yeah? This is the place where the gods used to live. So the ancients thought. And you can well imagine that when Paul left this place, as Darren mentioned, he was there for three Sabbaths. Um, I mean, our sermon series is going to go for a lot longer than three Sabbaths. You kind of imagine what could he possibly have accomplished in three Sabbaths. And you can imagine him walking away, looking at the city that he's left behind, these beautiful people who he's fallen in love with. And over his shoulder, he looks and he sees that mountain range, a constant reminder to him of the, this, this stark difference in, in culture and the way people thought about the world. And he's leaving them and all the while, there's like this very real threat that the people could go back to the things that they used to do, that they used to know. When I was a kid, I used to love going to the library, and I had this phase where, I don't know, I just got interested in reading Greek mythology. And I used to go to that section of the library, and I was just very fascinated learning about this culture and learning what they believed. But as I got older, I started to appreciate the work that Paul had to do. These guys in places like Thessalonica would often adopt the qualities of the gods that they followed. And these people were not people you and I would like to admire in any sense. Um, they lived very interesting, wild, crazy lives. But they were often held as the model of what it was to aim to be in life. And so Paul has some real deep-seated concerns and as Darren mentioned, the letter to the Thessalonians really does take on, as Faye also mentioned in our story, a pastoral quality. Uh, it has this tone about it where you can really see Paul's heart for his community. And I really want all of us this morning to sort of listen to this message in terms of, and think in terms of who are the people God's called me to be a pastor towards. Yes, we've got some paid people to be our pastoral staff, and we've got some awesome YPWs, but all of you in your own right have been invited 
to be a follower of God, and with that comes the responsibility to share the gospel in your immediate vicinity. And the people you share the gospel with are the people you have a pastoral responsibility to today. So I really want you to think in terms of your family, your friends, your colleagues, and even the people here at church, the people in your Sabbath school classes, the people in your midweek groups. Who are the people God's invited you to journey with? We're going to be journeying through the latter part of chapter 3 in the beginning of 4. Darren did a really good job of sort of demonstrating how Paul, throughout his letter to the Thessalonians, um, has this end time focus, that Jesus is coming. And we're excited about that, yeah? We, we are, I believe, excited about it. <laughs> but maybe some of us struggle to get excited about it for good reason. Because when we look at our own lives, we're like, I don't know if I'd be ready when he comes. And so I hope this message really speaks into to part of those fears. And so I'm going to pick up in chapter 3 of Thessalonians, verse 5, if you want to follow in your Bibles. But Paul has this real concern. And he says in verse 5, that is why when I could bear it no longer, I sent Timothy to find out whether your faith was still strong. I was afraid that the tempter had gotten the best of you and that our work had been useless. In chapter 2, Paul mentions that he had wanted to return back to to, to Thessalonica. Say that 10 times, Thessalonica, Thessalonica, I'm not going to do that. (laughs) But he really had wanted to go back and were told in chapter 2 that he had been blocked by the enemy, been blocked by Satan. And he had felt this, I don't know how he had got this impression but you've got to, if, you, if you're Paul and you have a pastoral heart for this community, you've got to be thinking in, this, in, a, in an age where there's no internet, no uh, mobile communication, it's all snail mail, Paul's like, is completely in the dark on what's going on in this community. He really is concerned, and so he does send Timothy, he tries to, to see how these guys are going. He's worried that Satan has gotten the best of them. This idea is that, you know, Satan had ultimately tempted them to go back to an old way of life. And Paul says, you know, I I was concerned that maybe all of the work I'd put into you guys was useless, says the NLT. Strong language. Made me think of moments in my life where I've been investing, doing Bible studies with people, and you kind of wonder, where's this going? (laughs) Darren, have you ever had those moments where you're sitting there across the table of someone and it, you're just like, I don't know. And this is what we live for. As ministers, we love to do Bible studies. You know, I don't know. The accountant, it's getting the perfect spreadsheet. For the person in sales, it's having a perfect quarter. Pastors, we just love to see people connect with Jesus. And when you're sitting down at the dinner table or wherever it is and people aren't engaging, you're just like, oh, you just wonder if it's a waste of time. I had a moment like that, Faye, when I, when I was volunteering at your school at Heritage. There were three kids in like year nine, and, I, and they had shown interest after the week of worship, and I'd come every week, and I was doing studies. Faye had her hands full as the only chaplain of, a, of two schools. It was ridiculous. So I'm like, I'll come and help. But these kids, they were just week on, week out. They were just, they, like one kid would just be like, <coughs> And I'm just like, and so Jesus said to Peter, and I'm like, is that guy sleeping? And his like, friend's like, yeah, he does that all the time. I'm like, oh, my word. Uh, <laughs> and I'm like, green, Pastor Ryan, I don't know how to be, you know, excuse me, wake up, wake up. Like, you just feel like you're wasting your time. And I don't know about you, but maybe when you look at your own lives, there are people in your life where you've tried to share Jesus with, you've tried to talk to them about Jesus, and you're just wondering, where's it all going? This is a very real reality of having a pastoral heart. Sometimes I wonder if if Paul was, when he was telling this to to the Thessalonians, I'm wondering if he had this particular passage in mind. And this comes from Isaiah 49 and verse 6. He says, but my work seems so useless. This is Isaiah speaking. I have spent my strength for nothing and to no purpose, yet I leave it all in the hands of the Lord. That is ultimately where the pastor has to arrive every time. Because you can get to a spot where every week you're showing up or whenever you come to those family events and you're sharing Jesus, you're just wondering what it's going, what's happening. 
you just have to leave it in God's hands. And maybe some of us just don't even bother leaving it in God's hands. We just don't even try. Isaiah continues to say, I will trust God for my reward. And there's this idea that in the judgment, God will sort of see what this per- the individual has done. Go, you know what? I know it was hard, but you did the right thing. You stuck with it. And what I see here in the life of Paul and in Isaiah's writings, it's so easy to sort of become indifferent, right? It's so easy to become indifferent about the people in our lives that God has placed us, that God is calling us to, to share something with. And we can just think, you know what? They're, they're, not even gonna, they're not even gonna be interested in Jesus. They're not even gonna be interested in the fact that I go to church on a Sabbath and it's restful and it's great. They, they're, just, they're just not gonna be different. So you know what? I don't even care. I'm just not gonna bother. And that's really challenging because I'm just gonna be honest, I've had moments like that where I'm just like, Should I come back to Heritage next week? (laughs) Do I have to see these boys? And you just don't know what God's going to do. But if you approach it from that perspective, you'll give up every time. You need to trust, like Isaiah says, that God's got it in his hands. You've got to leave some of that work to God. It's a partnership. And Paul, I think, models this better than any person in the New Testament. That just tireless work ethic, as we saw in our introduction to who he was, this guy really just kept on moving forward in spite of the beatings, in spite of the dying. You know, like, he he just never thought about his own comfort. He's like, you know what, I'm just going to keep on sharing Jesus in spite of the consequences, in spite of these people don't, you know, fall in love with him or not. I have a responsibility to them. And friends, all of us here today have that same responsibility. In verse 6 of our passage, Uh, in the Thessalonians, he continues, but now Timothy has just returned, bringing us good news about your faith and love. He reports that you always remember our visit with joy and that you want to see us as much as we want to see you. I love that there's good news in this story. And, you know, Timothy returns from his visit to the Thessalonians and the place hadn't burnt down. Amen? Amen. The church hadn't totally dissipated. There wasn't internal fighting and all this sort of stuff. They had sort of kept the faith. And, you know, it got me thinking, often as ministers, we get moved from church to church. I've been a bit blessed. I've just had ministry uh, in Victoria. Faye's been to New South Wales. Darren's been to another country. He's been to South Australia. But often when you move... (laughs) That came off bad. (laughs) I mean, he's been to another country, New Zealand, and then South Australia. Um, but the point is, you go to all of these places, even in Melbourne, just moving from the Polish church to Bales to Casey, um, now here, you often leave people behind, people you've built strong relationships with, and you just don't know what's happened to them. And it's actually really hard. You're just sort of like, I've got a new community. I'm like, I have to invest in, I've got a lot of things I'm doing, but I I just, you check in from time to time, but it's not like you used to, it's not that weekly visit. And so it's always good news to find out that somebody you you helped raise up in the faith is now stronger than ever. And so friends, that's the ultimate goal. You know, don't give up on the people God's placed in your lives. Paul stuck with it and the invitation for us today is to stick with the people he's placed in our corner. In verse 7, he continues, so we have been greatly encouraged. Stick with it and maybe there'll be some encouragement at the other end. In the midst of our troubles and suffering, going through the hard times, as I mentioned, this was such good news for Paul. It was like a, a, a salve on wounds. And just to hear that this little community that he only spent three weeks was sticking with it made such a difference in his life. Verse 8, we continue, it gives us new life to know that you are strengthened, firm in the Lord. How we thank God for you. Because of you, we have great joy as we enter God's presence. Night and day, we pray earnestly for you, asking God to let us see you again to fill the gaps in your faith. Something I learned about Paul, which I I kind of knew, but I think it just really came to the fore for me as I was preparing for this, is 
You know, Ryan, you can't be with all of those people you've connected with over the years, but what you can do is pray for them. And Paul holds a high standard of how you care for somebody when you cannot be with them. And I think just life forces us to separate from time to time. I mean, you know, I'm looking forward one day to heaven just because I can be close to the people I love the most who are all over this planet, all over this country. But until then, we really have to trust these people into God's supernatural hands, yeah? And sometimes we forget these hands of God's are supernatural. God can preserve, God can keep people, even though we feel separated, even though we feel helpless. And so I want you to be encouraged. Who is that someone that maybe you've written off in your life? Put them in the hands of God. Take a page out of Paul's book. He prays for these people night and day until Timothy comes back with the good news. God is challenging us to go deeper with the people in our lives. May God, our Father, and our Lord Jesus bring us to you very soon. Friends, that prayer would continue, but it wouldn't be until Paul's third mission trip that he'd finally get back to the Thessalonians. And as we journeyed through Acts, some of you weren't there, but friends, these journeys happen not over weeks, but months and years. It wouldn't be years until Paul's ultimate dream, his prayer would be finally realized. Hang in there. This is a long game we're talking about. We're not talking about after church. Yep, I went home. I talked to my wife about uh, my brother who's been struggling. We prayed for him as we closed Sabbath, and then that was it. No, we're talking about something ongoing. This is something that's going to continually happen. And who knows, you may not even live to see the fruits of your prayer. But Paul kept on praying. It would take him many more years until he would finally get to these people that he loved to to really be there for them and help them grow in the next stage of their faith development. When I thought about this in my own life, I've been thinking, you know, I think a lot of us are here today because we've been blessed by good mothers, amen? Amen. Ellen White has this quote, one of our founders of our denomination, and she says, you know, one day in heaven we'll just have to be appreciative of so many strong mothers because a lot of people will be in the kingdom because of mum's work, mum's prayers. And I think I can, I'm 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 a living testimony of that. The amount of times where I'm like, mom, you know what, I just, I just wasn't sure about where this message was going and Mom's like, I was praying for you. How did it go? I'm like, I actually felt it went really well. Thank you, Mom. And it's just something really nice to know that you've got somebody in your corner who's praying for you. I have this weird story, but when I was a kid, I got hit on this knee walking to school by a Russian four-wheel drive. It was a Lada, for any of you who know a Lada. I got hit there. I got flung across the road, and it was bad, and the church came and visited this and that. But one of my mom's friends from work came and visited, and she was Hindu. And she said, you know, just like a Christian would come to you and say, like, Ryan, I've been praying for you. She came and she's like, this might sound very insensitive, but she's like, literally like, Ryan, I've been praying to Vishnu for you. And I'm just like, I actually really appreciate that. (laughs) I don't believe in Vishnu. But just knowing that somebody was praying to some pagan god made a huge difference. But knowing that someone's praying to a real God for you, how much more power does that have over you? Just knowing, making you feel confident. Friends, we are being invited to go deep and pray. That was a bit of a weird analogy. I could see everyone's like, (laughs) I don't know, Pastor Ryan said we got to pray to Hindu gods. No, no, no. All right. (laughs) But friends, we are being invited to go deep with our friends, to go deep with our community. Paul continues in verse 12, may the Lord make your... Make your love for one another and for all people grow and overflow, just as our love for you overflows. Pastoral heart. May he, as a result, make your heart strong, blameless, and holy as you stand before God, our Father, when our Lord Jesus comes again. Darren talked very well last week about this idea of the second coming. And here, Paul takes the second coming and says, just kind of like Isaiah, you know, God's going to and I don't know how this process works, but somehow when God comes, he's going to just want an account of how, how did you love the people in your life? How did this work out? The Greek that Paul uses here, um, may God make your heart strong. This is an infinitive verb. And the infinitive verb is really interesting. There are a few of these in this passage. 
An infinitive verb is a verb, it's an action that happens indefinitely into the future. This thing goes on, quote unquote, for infinity. And he's like, I'm praying that God will continually strengthen your hearts, will continually give you a loving heart. This is something the Christian should never stop having or growing in. Think of terms of like the saying, time keeps marching on. The verb there, marching, would be an infinitive, an infinitive verb. Time just never stops, it keeps on going. The Christian never stops loving, never stops growing his heart for other people. And so from Paul's prayer, we get a really good look at what it means to be pastoral. And Paul is challenging a very, you know, set in way of thought that these Thessalonians would have had. Remember that they lived in the shadow of Olympus. And one of the stories around the Olympians was that there were these three old ladies called um, the Fates. And the Fates knew when you were going to be born, when you were going to die, and they had this little hair, and when you die, they'd snip the hair, and you were dead, and you'd go off to wherever you went next. But they knew everything. And so often, if you were Greek-minded, you just wouldn't challenge the things that would happen to you. Life just happened because it was all in the hands of the fates. And Paul, by praying for his community, is saying to them, you know what? There is a power that is stronger than the fates. Friends, have you resigned your life to fate? Have you given up that God can make a change in your situation, in the situations of your friends? Paul's pastoral heart tells us that we need to keep pursuing the God who is above all other gods. Amen? God can make a change in the lives of the people in your life. But Paul in his pastoral heart takes a turn in chapter 4 and he goes to an interesting place. This place, you know, often when Paul writes, he will address an, an, a sin issue. And in the lives of the Thessalonians, they didn't actually have a sin issue to address. But Paul kind of does what a good parent does when you're raising a kid like Harry, like Harry, you know what? There's this little thing up in our house and it flashes. One day if that thing makes a really large noise, that means there's a fire and you need to get out of the house. Get low, don't stand, there's smoke, all this stuff. And I'm training my kid how to survive a potential worst case scenario, right? And Paul sees a potential worst case scenario here for the Thessalonians, and that has to do with this three letter word which God made very beautifully, but it's become depraved because of sin, and that word is sex. Paul is very concerned that his community may fall into sin because of sex. This is not a topic we talk a lot about, and I'm going to keep it as kosher as I can. But he goes to some interesting places here, and we haven't even got to Corinthians. I don't know which one of us is doing Corinthians, but there's some interesting sins there. We're not going to go deep into it today, but Paul saw that there was a very real problem with sex in this culture. Here's what he says in chapter 4. Finally, dear brothers and sisters, we urge you in the name of the Lord Jesus to live in a way that pleases God, as we have taught you. You live this way already, and we encourage you to do so even more. For you remember that we taught you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. God's will is for you to be holy, so stay away from all sexual sin. And the passage continues, and there's a very uh, immediate context that he's addressing, and we're not going to go into that. It, it was just about how to treat your brothers and sisters in a, in a, you know, a, a holy way. But we just want to focus on these passages to close our time out. Paul, again, is not addressing an issue, but he sees a potential issue on the horizon. Friends, I'm so glad he spoke into this because this is an issue we live with today. Statistically, there are people right here now who are struggling with sexual sin. And whenever I've mentioned this at any church, you can always hear the needle drop because we know how real it is. See, in this culture, sexual sin was probably, it was probably not something that was so hidden. It was actually celebrated. The Thessalonians had a culture, as did most of the Greeks, where sexual sin for the man was not actually seen as sin. It was just seen what a good young man does. For a woman, actually, living the same kind of life was actually seen as something not good. Double standards, right? But this was a real part of that culture. 
And it's amazing to me, and I just want you to catch this, it's amazing to me that these, this group of people, just after three weeks, had overcome this aspect of their lives. And Paul's just encouraging them, I need you to stick with it, I need you to stick with it. I mean, some of us have been to church for our whole lives and we're still struggling with this sin. And Paul somehow had, had, had pointed them in the right direction, they were walking the good walk. A lot of these people had not been exposed to the Torah. They had not been Judaized, as we'd seen in our other letters. And so they didn't actually have anything to fall back onto. They didn't have the teachings of Moses like other Gentile converts. These guys were walking the walk, friends, and I need you to see this because I'm hoping right now I'm painting a picture for somebody who's struggling right now. These men and women were having a successful walk, a successful pure walk with Jesus, only after three weeks of Paul spending time with them. They didn't know the Old Testament. They didn't know all of the purity laws. They didn't have all of that. Somehow God inside of them was, was leading to a new man, a new woman. There was a new heart. And we were seeing, they were, Paul was seeing this, and when Timothy comes back, he says, you know what? These guys are on fire. They're, they haven't dropped the ball. They're walking that walk. It's amazing. And friends, if, if, if Paul, after three weeks, could have that kind of impact, God can still have that impact on our church today. I want there to be good news for people, because I know, I know there are people who are struggling with this right now. Do not give up on your friends. Don't give up on you. That's my pastoral heart today. I know this is a big sin. I know that it's a real issue. But God wants you to know that there is uh, you know, there is a, a light at the end of the tunnel. And, for, and for, for Paul, this comes in the form of holiness. The sermon's called Hard to Be Holy because it's right. It's hard to be holy, right? Holiness is this enigmatic concept in the Bible. What is it all about? How do we get it? Paul here in this passage is saying, is not saying that Merely talking about this sin is going to make you holy. He's not just saying submission to some moral principles and ideals is going to make you holy. Being separated from your sin, going through a season where you do not engage in sexual sin, that's not going to make you holy, according to Paul. Correct understanding of the theology of sex and purity and righteousness, that isn't going to make you holy either. And I need to say that because I dare say some of us here today have tried to pursue those as different uh, uh, avenues to, to experiencing freedom from sexual sin. The Bible says if holiness is the goal, well, in Psalm 77, 13, David says reflectively about God, your ways, O God, are holy. Holiness is solely seen in the person of God. In Leviticus 20, 26, the writer of that book says, you are to be holy. This is God speaking to, to, to humanity or to the nation of Israel. You are to be holy to me because I, the Lord, am holy. The only way we experience holiness in our lives is because God has transferred it to us through some sort of process. We are holy because God is holy. The Lord, uh, the Lord I am holy and I have set you apart from the nations to be my own. Paul's invitation to walk a holy walk, to walk a life of purity, it just can't be something from somebody who goes, you know what, I, I, Jesus is okay, he was a good guy, he was a good moral teacher, you know those people out there, he was a good guy, I can't buy into the, that whole divinity thing of Jesus, I can't buy into that bodily resurrection thing, it just doesn't make sense, but he was a really good teacher and he did a lot of good things. Well, friend, let me ask you, what about all of those changed lives who follow in the wake of Jesus? How do you explain them? They don't just happen by assenting to the te teachings of Jesus in some moralistic way. They don't just go, you know what, I'm going to turn the other cheek when somebody slaps me or somebody does the wrong thing to me. I'm not going to walk the extra mile just because I can. I hate Romans. I don't want to walk an extra mile with their luggage. I don't want to turn the other cheek. That's not naturally me. And you can tell me to be that person, but in and of myself, I struggle. I, I really get mad. I get angry at people. And so you can't just assent to the teachings of Jesus 
Jesus needs to come inside of you and change you from the inside out. That's how you experience success in this journey. That's how you experience holiness. Holiness, one theologian I found says, means conforming to the character of God. It's letting God's character wash over you and change you for the better. Verse 4, Paul says, then each of you will control his own body. I'm going to invite the band up now as we just kind of wrap it up. But friends, when we invite God to, to, into our lives, when we start to focus just on him, and friends, if, if there's one thing I'm seeing as we go through the letters of Paul, Paul keeps inviting people to focus on Jesus, focus on God. And we want to focus on Paul because Paul focuses on Jesus. Paul focuses on God. He says in verse 4, when you do this, then each of you will control his own body. How many of us want that self, that, that, that control, that fruit of the Spirit that we looked at a couple of weeks ago in Galatians? Each of you, you will control his own body and live in holiness and honor. And honor sorry. Self-control, as we saw in the letter of Galatians, only happens when we walk daily with Jesus. Friends, the invitation for us today is to walk daily with Jesus once again, to grow in our heart, as Paul says in the infinitive. I want you to keep growing in love. We only do that by looking at the person of Jesus as revealed in the Scriptures.